Welcome back, everyone, to what I have chosen to call a history of rock and roll in film and rock and roll. You may call it what you like. So this is a, a almost becoming a catchphrase with me. If you've been listening to the show for a while, you've heard me say this before. This one kind of got away from me. And by that, I mean it's ended up becoming longer than I thought it was going to be. And I've split it And this part two is now going to be parts two and three. Um, there will be there's twice as much material already recorded as you're about to hear in this episode ready to go. Uh, but I wanted to put off the final episode a little longer. I've reached out to White Zombies drummer Ivan De Prume, who uh, is now in a band called, I believe it's Boundless Joy. He's got a studio down in, I believe, Oregon. And uh, I will see if he responds to my Facebook and Instagram messages as, as a request for either an interview or point, pointing me towards pre-existing interviews that would already say what it is he wants to be said. I don't want to waste his time, but um, he seems fairly active on social media and might be receptive to a conversation, which I would love. So I'm going to save the outcome of that for the third and final White Zombie episode. Today, we're going to go back into accounts from the band members and uh, information about the film, Bela Lugosi's career, and... We're going to have a good time, man. We're going to have a real good time. So ladle yourself up a pizza, blend yourself up a mushroom milkshake, or perhaps have a nice glass of hot celery, uh, whatever it is you like that makes you feel good and refreshed. It's the, almost the end of the year. It's a wild time. I hope you're doing okay. I hope you're doing well. I hope you have nice people around and nice things to do. I truly, truly do wish uh, good things for you. Um, And if you wish good things for the show, and why wouldn't you? And you'd like to help support, and why wouldn't you? uh, Please tell a friend. Please leave a comment or a review or a thumbs up or something nice like that. It's uh, without advertising. It takes a lot to get more listeners, and it takes a lot to break through the algorithms. I'm nowhere near accomplishing that, but uh, hopefully word of mouth will help some. Um, eh, Maybe if I get this new job I was uh, interviewing for yesterday, I will have some money in the old bank once again, and I'll try some, some, I don't know, some garbage ads of some kind. We'll see. Also, if you know someone with a podcast that might uh, have me on as a guest, if it's a movie podcast or a a rock podcast or a history podcast or an entertainment media podcast. I have uh, no qualms about uh, going on someone else's uh, show and and answering questions or having a nice conversation with them. All right, that's enough of me yapping for now about nothing in particular. Let's hear me yapping about the members of White Zombie. So let's get into Jay Younger's story of his guitars and other gear for a bit. Uh, this is straight from his blog. And as I've mentioned on the last episode, you can't look at any of the photos on the blog now. So you can't see what it is he's referring to. And he's a very visual guy. And he posted a lot of photographs and uh, some video and some audio, and he was a real trooper for a long time, man. He he provided a lot of information. So I want to keep it to what was the most exciting to me when I found it most relevant for White Zombie fans. This section is about guitar number three, as he calls it, the WZ guitar. The guitar from the Thunderkiss 65 video. And now, I'm not doing this because I think everyone has a thirst for guitar technical specifications. I'm doing this, me, your narrator, not Jay. I'm doing this because when it comes to a band like this and an artist like this, you can learn a lot about their history from their gear and the way they talk about it. Same thing happens with Jimi Hendrix. You can track his whole life uh, as a guitarist. 
by talking about what he was playing and who he was playing it with and where he was gigging with it at various times. And someone's done that in a book called Jimi Hendrix Gear. I'm going to use that for a Hendrix episode. I keep threatening to do that. Um, And Jay did that with his blog a long time ago. He says, this is the guitar from the Thunder Kiss 65 video. So get that in your head. Subject of much speculation, email, and more than one drunken late night phone call. Lent to the Hard Rock Cafe in the 1990s, finally purchased by them in the 2000s. Spotted in various locations around the world. And he should know, he travels around the world all the time. That's what he does now um, when he's not remastering horror soundtracks or doing other cool audio stuff. He says, in early 1990, the cracking of the Firebird's headstock forced me to get serious about finding a spare. It would need to be a metal guitar with a Floyd. But being able to afford something like that, used even, was out of the question. The Kramer Focus body I'd gotten from my friend Chris for 30 bucks two years ago was an option. On the back of the photo below, which Chris sent me soon after I left Chicago, he wrote under the banner, feeling homesick yet? More about Kramer. I felt some words of praise from Mr. Floyd Rose are in order. Even though the headstock broke off months ago, the guitar is still in tune and playable, unquote. Uh, I met Chris through the Chicago hardcore scene during the period where my contemporaries and I were drifting away from punk and leaving it behind entirely, then scattering to go to college, work, or up to something else. We were inseparable. We both dropped out of school at the same time. I lent him my guitar, which he proceeded to learn how to play better than I could in about six weeks. He got me a job at the photo lab where he worked, the contraband containing metal Kodak film can. See it? Uh, I assume there's, you know, film canisters uh, back in the 80s used to be great vessels for for marijuana. Uh and, and and drugs of that sort. I assume that's what he's referring to. Um, like I said, can't see it because the photos are gone, which allowed me to save up enough money, so I thought, to move to NYC. Um, so he gets a job at a photo mat, which is where you would develop people's like vacation pictures or, you know, whatever. Um, and then he says there were, let's see. We consumed music voraciously, not only Metallica, Slayer, Venom, the metal bands we were obsessed with, but everything. Notice the Residence LP in the photo we can't see. Which we listened to on cheap turntables through big three-way speakers made of chipboard. Um, the notes about the guitars, or broken Kramer, early 80s Hamer special, a common sight in Illinois pawn shops then. <laughs> um... Several items that are particularly evocative of the era. Shelves made from stolen milk crates, empty Ausberger bottles, guitar tabliture books. I collected some really excellent prismatic hot rod stickers at swap meets. Unless we had to get uh, somewhere fast, we always pulled the van over and went to flea markets. If you don't know what those words mean, I can't tell you or explain it well enough. Prismatic hot rod stickers. Google search it. Um, look up what flea markets were. <laughs> uh, I bought a neck from the ESP shop on 48th Street, begged and borrowed other parts, cobbled everything together, got an EMG pickup and pots and installed them myself. My first attempt at doing my own soldering. Not that I knew how, but I copied the wiring from my Charvel and it worked. The assembled guitar didn't intonate correctly and thus was never quite in tune. Uh, luthiers out there, guitar repair people out there know what that means. If you don't, it's basically the placement of the bridge on the guitar has to be very specific to allow you to be able to play in tune up and down the neck. It sounds normal when you're tuning the guitar, when you check the open strings, E, A, D, G, B, E, or whatever it is, and in whatever tuning you're in, and it seems fine. But then you keep playing higher and higher up the neck, and you're like, how come these notes aren't in tune? Well, because your bridge is in the wrong place, or your neck is too much bow, it's too bent, um, or the, the strings are too high off the fretboard in some other manner. Um, if it's really out of tune after you tune it in the first f- f- five, f- that first position, uh, then in that case, your nut is too high. The slots it's sitting in are too high off the board. He says, I... Uh, 
it was my main guitar <laughs> and it hardly ever broke strings. I mean, like never. So I probably only played it once or twice on stage. Um, although it did make an appearance in some early experiments with the tuning down in 92 and 93. The guitar tracks on La Sexorcisto are 99% the same setup. Charvel 6 through a Proco Rat through a Marshall. But I did use the WZ guitar, which had a twangier sound, for some leads and overdubs. For example, check out the little tritone symphony that happens in Starface. From 3 minutes 24 to 3 minutes 40. As for Chris, he stayed in Chicago and formed a band, which was about as different from mine as possible. Trench Mouth. A muscular post-punk sound, think Discord Records, kind of, into something else that I really... Uh, can't pigeonhole a trippy dub inflected science fiction vibe that was groovy yet angular. I know that's not saying anything. I guess you'll just have to listen to them. <laughs> and he provides links that we can't access now. Um, now. This was the grunge era, yet they were very spiffy guys who somehow kept their suits presentable on van tours. I ran into them from time to time. They slept on my floor once in LA. They played me heavy dub and electronic records. Music totally outside my experience. Today, in a widening of divergent paths, Chris, who I talk to occasionally, is a chemistry professor. Now let's talk about one of the Icemans, the black one that has the, um, has the bumper stickers on it in the More Human Than Human video and the like white sort of uh, ivory-colored binding. It says, here is a mid-late 90s photo of my 1994 Ibanez IC500 Iceman, referred to by fans as the Right On guitar. Um, it's got that Right On bumper sticker with a fist, and then uh, a bumper sticker that says Drop Dead. It's got a little uh, sort of Diablo face in between the two pickups and some other stickers on the back end behind the uh, bridge stop tailpiece. The Japanese factory-made Set Neck guitar... Uh, not neck through, because he knows what set neck means, uh, that I recorded all the drop C sharp tunes on Astro Creep 2000 with. Creature of the Wheel, Real Solution 9, the rhythm parts for More Human Than Human, etc. I also played it in the More Human Than Human video. There's an article that features something uh, that, that's, that doesn't work. I clicked on it, blah, 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 blah. Bridge, uh, bridge pickup is a Seymour Duncan Custom. And the next, a Duncan 59. Uh, my standard setup at the time, I read an interview with Eddie Van Halen in a guitar mag where he explained his idea that anchoring pickups directly to the guitar's wood body as opposed to mounting them in a pick guard or plastic pickup rings results in more tone or harmonic richness or something, which sounded plausible to me. So I had the guys at Ibanez do that. So I don't really know if it makes much difference, but it gives the guitar a utilitarian chopped look that I dig. I had all my gu guitars wear with a push-pull coil tap pots. As I was 99.98% of the time playing loud, grinding heavy metal, such a thing might seem a little silly, but it's a high performance, all the options feature that I like to have if I can. All the rhythm guitar parts on Astro Creep were played in the bridge pickup volume and tone knobs on 10, but there are some lead and textural parts that were done with various humbucking single coil combinations. He has notes about the More Human Than Human video shoot. He says, note number one, we rented an old custom tuck and roll blue sparkle vinyl amp as a prop. Uh, and I plugged it in and discovered that it was in full working order. Uh, if you don't know what that is, I would say Google it. Custom with a K, tuck and roll blue sparkle vinyl. Uh, I brought cables and pedals with me because I have a pathological dislike of videos where the band is pretending to play but don't have their instruments plugged in. Don't ask. I don't know. That's just me. Anyway, video shoots are long and they are boring. But at least I was able to play guitar to amuse myself. The two pedals you see are a Roland AF60 BG Fuzz and an original MXR script logo Blue Box. Both were manufactured around 1975. Uh, Rob and I both showed up wearing the same, oh, sorry, both showed up that day wearing old Sam Hain t-shirts. Weird, right? Also in the photo, my custom shop made ICJ100WZ. Uh, that's his green sparkly signature guitar. Uh, and a selection of Ultraman toys given to me by kids in Japan. So it's not like, you know, 
it's not like he's on the set of a White Snake video or a Poison or Bon Jovi or whatever, or he's not Mick Jagger. You know, they're not. He, they're there to like do the thing. But if he can play guitar and actually perform on his instrument and practice while he's there and play in some pedals and a funky amplifier, he will. He's not. You know, he he's not. Uh, he's not like trying to hook up with chicks on the set or calling girls. And he's also not uh, uh, arranging for new contracts to be signed or whatever. He's just there to do his thing and have a good time when he can. Uh, I, I obviously, if he was wearing that Sam Hain t-shirt, you can't see it cause he's got a, a jean jacket over it. And Rob has the Sam Hain in shirt, very much visible in that video. Um, or maybe Jay changed his into something else. I haven't watched it in a while because I watched it way too much when I was, you know, of age back in 1995. I had it on a video cassette tape. And let's see. Oh, there's a great little note. Studio trick. In an effort to get a heavier tone, it took a D string from a pack of Sean's bass strings. We both used Dean Markley blue steels, and I still do that. Uh... And I still do. Sorry. That cryogenically frozen deal seems like bullshit, but they do, in fact, sound a little better and they wear out faster. Choose your battle. (laughs) That's what I that's that's been my experience with a lot of guitar strings and bass strings, too. If it sounds brighter and more clear and punchier and has lots more volume as soon as you put it on your guitar or your bass than anything that you're normally used to. It fades fast. It's like fruit stripe gum. You know, you chew on it for a few seconds and all the flavor is gone. But at least there's like 50 more in the pack as opposed to, a, you know, some Dean Markley's. You got to buy a whole nother pack. God damn it. But he says um, he was using that D string from the bass for the lowest string on his guitar. He's like, I had to notch out the slut in. The, sorry. Slot in the nut. See, slot nut. I made a mistake. Uh, a little, but that Fet bass string actually did give the guitar a slightly more substantial sound. Um, probably pulled the fuck out of his neck, too, until he took it off. <laughs> also, if I was trying to do a part where my sound wasn't working and something completely different was needed, I would patch my entire rig into one of her Ampeg SVTs. Several lead parts on the album were recorded that way. That's great. That's cool. Oh, man. Man. Probably the ones where there's like a ton of fuzz on the guitar and weird uh, noises and shit. Back in the 1990s, you could still find vintage unused stickers of the biker skull devil blacklight (laughs) head shop type. And I covered everything I owned with them. I don't remember where I got the 1970s right on bumper sticker. Probably at a flea market. The Drop Dead one, I think, came with a zine, like a magazine, fanzine. I don't remember which. Possibly Jim Goad's Answer Me. That sounds about right, right? There's also one of uh, these, which I got from this excellent store. Let's see what the link, if I can get anything from the links. Open link. Um, It's loading. Nope. It says a vintage gummed back paper label I found, which... I think it's from some sort of toy. And there's a broken image link that says Mr. Satan, August 26th, 2010. So <laughs> good luck to you. And then there's a, there's a link to a store called Uncle Fun Chicago. And uh, it will, will not open. It will not open that link. Ah, what are you going to do? What you going to do, kids? By the way, that MXR blue box he talks about, um, that's a cr- awesome sounding, crazy little pedal. And it's like an octave with a fuzz, if I'm not mistaken, uh, unless unless I'm remembering it totally incorrectly. But like the, there's a, it's a small metal box painted blue with a cursive script MXR blue box sort of uh, logo or writing on it. And like Slash has used it a lot. and King Buzzo from the Melvins used it a lot for a long, long time to the point that uh, a gentleman from Dodd Effects in the 90s came to him and told him he wanted to make a pedal based on his sound. And he allowed the gentleman to look at his pedal, open it up, take notes, maybe take photos or whatever. Um, And that became the 
a DOD buzz box, which you have to pay $330 for on Reverb.com nowadays. Because um, he made a more extreme version. It wasn't the MXR box. It was like, take the circuit, make it more ridiculous. And it is, it, it, I remember getting like tons of like great Atari noises out of it. A lot of 8-bit distortion kind of sounds out of it. Bit crushing kind of stuff uh, back in the 1990s when I would play them in, in stores and I couldn't afford it anyway. Even at like 100 bucks or whatever the hell it was at the time. Uh, and also if I could afford it, I couldn't use it in the bands that I was in at the time. Uh, but you know, you can, I, I, I found something that does those noises plus like 15 more in the Earthquaker devices, uh, data corruptor, uh, pedal, uh, not saying everyone needs that. I honestly think most people don't and I don't need it. 98% of the time I'm playing guitar, but it's a lot of fun. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. It's a fun pl uh, pedal to plug in uh, when someone else in your band is like messing with the knobs on their instrument or unplugging themselves from their amp or checking their pedals. Just start hitting like harmonics or other weird notes on your guitar with that pedal turned on and it just goes... Uh, maybe I'll... Maybe I'll if I remember later, maybe I'll insert some noises from that pedal into the into the track here. Oh, hey, quick note from Jay here. Me, Jay, not that Jay. After the fact, uh, I realized that there are photos. Um, as I'm just, just kind of glancing over some stuff of Jay on the set of More Human Than Human, he is wearing his jean jacket over his Sam Hain t-shirt. Sawin, Sowin. Uh, whatever you want to call it, uh, he did keep it on. He is wearing it underneath his jacket. It's just one of those black and white ones. White, white print on black shirt. Rob has color on his. That's why I, I don't think I ever noticed Jay was wearing a shirt of the same band in the video. Too distracted by how awesome his jean jacket is with all the patches. And how awesome his guitars look, obviously. Now here's the sound of that data corruptor pedal I was talking about. Sean's narrative from the early days. Uh, last we left off, she and Rob had met for the first time and started uh, living together <laughs> and, and forming a band. She talks about um, they uh, started working on the first four songs in White Zombies history for our, uh, our first seven inch Gods on Voodoo Moon. I wrote most of the riffs. Rob wrote lyrics and aptly named the band. We picked the studio out of the yellow pages for its name, Bat Cave, and its price, $15 an hour. I believe we spent two hours there, making possibly the cheapest record in history. Due to our very limited funds, we also pressed the bare minimum, 300 copies. I took the photo for the cover and hand-drew the logo. Rob did the illustration for the back, and I color-copied the covers at work, a photo stat and copy store for free in the, in quotes <laughs> we walked 100 of these all over manhattan dropping them off in record stores and trying to get them to college radio stations rob and i split up the remainder and stashed them away because he hated the record and wanted to move on so they pick up a different guitar player and different drummer for the recording of their next seven inch uh the guitarist is a guy named tim jeffs who was a roommate of rob's uh from parsons art school and he was there for the recording of one, uh, of, well, actually their first gig, uh, CBGB's audition night. He would have lasted more than a few months, but he went home for a summer break and we wanted to keep playing while he was gone. Tim was a great guitarist, but not quite the sound we were looking for. The drummer, Ivan D. Prum, was still in high school and he had played with me in Life, a band she was in previously. Straight out of Brooklyn, this kid showed up to meet us in a cutoff Ramones shirt with a boombox on his shoulder, blasting metal. 
We had to give him directions to Washington Square. He had no idea where anything was in Manhattan. Ivan became part of our band and family and toured and played on six of our eight records. We made a second seven-inch titled Pig Heaven with a pressing of 1,000, dividing them in half with two different Xeroxed covers. We replaced him with guitarist Tom Five, perfectly fitting the bill we had asked for, sewn into Greg Ginn of Black Flag, Butthole Surfers, and Black Sabbath. Tom Five is the... I guess Tom Five is the first <laughs> in the in the uh, White Zombie Extended Universe to have the have the number after your name. Because uh, <laughs> Rob's little brother, of course, uh, went on to become Spider in the band Power Man 5000. And initially he just went by Spider, and there was one person in the band that had a number after his name, and that was Adam 12, uh, the guitarist who I... I always loved his parts. I always loved his playing on those early uh, Paramount 5000 records. And then, because uh, there, there was a cop show called One Adam 12 in, I'm guessing, the late 50s. I, I, it used to be on Nick at Night. And uh, then when the, the Paramount 5000 guys made their second major label record for Geffen, you know, Tonight the Stars Revolt, suddenly everybody had a number after their name, and Spider was Spider 1. Uh, <laughs> And uh, I know there was there's other examples somewhere out there too. I for, I want to say there's somebody else in the Rob Zombie universe that was doing a number after his name or something like that. Uh, call in, please call in if you know who I'm talking about. Now uh, she says with Tom we crafted a sound that started gaining us an underground recognition and some praise from highbrow critics. We were dubbed Psycho Damage Art Noise among other things. Once our 12 inch EP titled Psycho Head Blowout was released in '87. Probably the best thing about that record is the uh, Avedon-esque portrait of the band on the cover, taken by a then-unknown Michael Levine, a friend of mine at Parsons. Iggy Pop listed our fourth recording uh, and first LP, Soul Crusher, as a favorite in Rolling Stone, which was the first record for which we did a full U.S. tour. Up until this point, we had self-released all these vinyl records on our own made-up label, Silent Explosion. The touring and local notoriety led to an indie record deal with Caroline Records in 89. Yvonne Garrett, who had become a fan and friend of the band, signed us. They re-released Soul Crusher, and we kept rehearsing, playing, and touring. She says, touring was the only way to get your name out there back in the 80s. During these tours, we slept on the floors of Steve Albini in Chicago, uh, Babes in Toyland in Minneapolis, Bruce Pavitt of Sub Pop in Seattle, The Dwarves in San Francisco, and L7 in Los Angeles. It was a pretty tight-knit scene across the country back then. Before everyone and their grandmother had a band. So there were only a couple in each town. As a result, you knew each other before <laughs> you met, and you then you inevitably played your gig with them and crashed at their place. The funny thing was, no matter whose floor we were crashing on, or even if all five of us, the band plus one roadie, were sleeping in the van at a truck stop, it was always nicer than being back in New York City. For most people, this lifestyle would have been roughing it. $5 a day, no real beds, etc. But to us, it was an awesome vacation, escaping the filth and squalor of our New York neighborhoods and homes. And, you know, squalor-filled neighborhoods that aren't all that affordable to live in, I'm, I'm sure, as well. Uh, <laughs> now, lest you think that uh, their stage designs and their look was something that came about, you know, when they, when they had more money... Uh, to put into that kind of a show and that kind of a, you know, presentation. Uh, she says, Our live shows were a visual explosion and cacophony of noise. We came across as tattered street urchins trying to put on a kiss show. We developed our own weird tribal style of heavy, chaotic music and a homemade pyro, stolen blinking streetlights, and crazy monster cutouts that Rob painted along with a logo banner that I painted. We had dreads and wore homemade, patched, dyed, and studded clothes and had tattoos. There were no other bands that sounded or looked like us, and people in the audience sometimes seemed like they were coming to check out a freak show. We toured Europe later that year, 1989, sleeping on more floors and living barely on $3 a day. A cup of coffee at the time in Europe cost about $3.50. So by the end of that tour, we were half starved. It was tough, but only made us look forward to touring at home all the more. I mean, a cup of coffee in 1989 in America, I mean, you could get it for... At gas stations, you could get a 
styrofoam cup full of coffee or you could fill up your own, you know, travel mug or whatever for less than a dollar. Definitely. Um, so yeah, that sucks. Everything's more expensive in Europe. <laughs> uh, our quality of life at this point was pretty bleak. We were so young and si- excited about what we were doing that we didn't notice. We lived in rundown single room apartments on the lower East side with no heat, no air conditioning, one or no windows, no kitchens, and sometimes no electricity. By the way, those apartments she's talking about, single room apartments, that's not single bedroom. That is you open a door and you have a room and you're probably using a toilet down the hallway that 20 other people use. But there were two things these dirt cheap apartments always did have. Rats and roaches. That's what happens when you live in a bad neighborhood on the basement of the first floor in New York City. I remember one basement apartment on East 13th Street where the drop ceiling caved in from broken sewage pipes. Filthy water and piles of rat droppings spilled everywhere. I also remember tripping over rats in the middle of the night while trying to maneuver my way, my way to the bath. Ah, there we go, to the bathroom. Once our old friends from North Carolina, Corrosion of Conformity, dropped by and Reed tripped on a rat coming down our stairs and totally freaked out. We were so used to them by that point that we just laughed. Oh, rest in peace, Reed Mullen, my favorite drummer. Uh, she says they lived off 25-cent bagels and 50-cent bottomless cups of coffee. Yep, there we go. With an occasional 75-cent slice of pizza from St. Mark's, I managed to earn my BFA at Parsons, working three jobs and practicing every night with the band in Ivan's basement. Touring would occur whenever there was a break in school for me or for Ivan, who was still in high school. We were a hardworking, driven band, but we had no final goal in sight. Um, This is kind of interesting to me because... Uh, This next part, I mean, I'm about to read is kind of interesting to me because I don't see any mention of John Ricci, who is the fellow that played on Make Them Die Slowly. It just goes to, um, she talks about what was like being in a band, making flyers, making music, playing shows, creating a scene, but not having any like long-term goals. But she says, things moved faster for the band when we hired our fifth and final guitarist, Jay. With our other guitarists, I had written almost all the riffs on bass, structured the songs, and would give the guitarists an idea of what we wanted them to do without being able to show them with Jay. We had a real writing partner. Some songs would be more my riffs. Some would be more his and some were an even mix for all the busy overworked Slayer riffs. Jay would balance it out with some good Hendrix groove parts and solid chugging metal riffs. Jay had grown up in Chicago listening to punk and metal and had been in the hardcore band rights of the accused when he was 15. He was coming from almost exactly the same perspective as us. And he was also a white zombie fan, which was a plus. And I would like to cross-reference this with Jay's notes from his blog. Uh, There's a photo that you probably can't see on his website anymore. Um, They all look very young. (laughs) They're all very cute. (laughs) They're very adorable uh, for a white zombie photo. Um, I mean, to me, they mostly look timeless because that's just, I don't know, it's just how it is with pictures of people in rock bands that you, you know, that you... People you looked up to when you were in high school don't ever, to me, they don't ever look young. Um, like, there's the four of them. The only one who's wearing any color is, is, uh, is Ivan, who's got a red, red shirt with a bunch of, with a cool looking design on it. I don't know what it is, but um, Rob's behind him in a leather jacket. Sean's to the right with a leather jacket. Her hair uh, is sort of a coppery red, like a dark strawberry copper red. Um, on the left-hand side is Jay in a white zombie T-shirt, you know, white on black print, um, and he's sort of he's sort of tilted to the side with his hair hanging, you know, a little bit, and you know, uh, over his shoulder, and uh, he's leaning on like a railing or something. He says this picture was taken by Michael Levine almost exactly twenty years ago, um, so that would have been oh he says when it was. Uh, I know because I met Robin Sean. The day after Martin Luther King Day, 1989, and almost right after they called, uh, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm doing, I'm doing like math in my head while I'm talking and I shouldn't do that Um, because I know he was a fan. He had seen them play. So that means he hadn't met them until this time. Like he had been at shows, I guess, uh, but hadn't introduced himself. Um, And almost right after they called me to come and do this And almost right after that, they called me to come and do this photo session with them before I had played a note. In fact, 
This night was when I first met their drummer, Ivan. I like to kid myself that I was so cool that they tried to, you know, they started to integrate me into the band before I even tried out. But the truth is, more along the lines of them desperately trying to find anyone with a pulse and some hair to play guitar. And Michael wanting to try out some new lights and needing a subject. I'm sure it didn't hurt that I'd followed the band closely in the year and a half since I'd moved to New York City. And I sort of got it. And I certainly did put everything I had into the band from that point on. Anyway, check this out. I'm just 22 years old and I'm trying to figure out how to look tough without a beard. Cute. (laughs) So this is one of those great things. I love when you look at a band's photos and you can tell that they're not (laughs) douchebags. Like he's the only one in the photo that's probably that is trying to project a certain kind of look. And I can tell you that from experience because I've done the same fucking look and uh, and I always look like an asshole doing it. Uh, somehow he doesn't though, (laughs) but Ivan looks natural. Sean looks natural. Rob looks funny. Um, like Rob's got a big smile on his face as he's got, he's got his, like his, his hands pressed out in front of him. Um, like he's doing moose antlers with his fingers neck, uh, behind Ivan's head. Like he's like, ah, there's Ivan trying to look cool for a pose and I'm going to make him look like a silly goofball. <laughs> it's very, it's the whole picture is adorable. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I don't know where you'll find this now, <laughs> except for in this, in this, uh, pages document that I say that I snagged the photo and dropped it into uh, a couple years ago. I don't know. You could probably look up white zombie band photos, 1989, you know, or something. When you find one with Jay Younger with no facial hair, uh, and and Ivan's wearing a red shirt, you'll know that you found the right one. And a hearty welcome to our drive-in theater. We have a wonderful evening's entertainment lined up for you, one that will provide several hours of pleasurable relaxation and diversion for you and your family. Did you fail to dress up for tonight's show? No tie, an old shirt and slacks, a house dress? Well, don't give it a thought. We're glad you came as you are. We just want you to enjoy yourselves. Now let's talk some more about Bella Lugosi. Uh, when we last left him, he had finished doing Dracula. They offered him Frankenstein, and he refused. Um, Supposedly, you know, there's we ended the last segment with a little question about that. Um, And that documentary I was referring to was from from the Blu-ray of Dracula. I swear, man, there's just so God, it's so frustrating. There's there's a new thought. There's a new sort of way of thinking that came about in the last 20, 30 years. Maybe it is the fault of the DVD and the Blu-ray special features when they still had those. Or maybe VH1 is to blame for this from the early 2000s. They're doing all those, uh, those talking head shows. Because like documentaries had gone from fairly dry informational stuff uh, to a lot of people exuberantly talking about how great something is. And that's supposed to be a documentary. <laughs> like, a, I need information here. I don't need you to tell me the thing I already like that I looked up and checked out a documentary about or purchased a documentary about is good. Um, there's just lot, there's lots of people just in this Bella Lugosi thing doing the, he was so great. This is how great he was. He was, a, he was so captivating and blah, blah, you know, I guess that's part of what they're trying to sell the appreciation for the guy. You know, that's not a, it's not a bad thing uh, on, on its face. It's just not helpful. <laughs> There's a lot to talk about uh, with with these people that did great things. And, you know, can we have a more tangible, a tangible description of what their impact was on the industry that they had? You know, anyways, uh, I, I can't pull that off by myself, but I can talk. I can talk us through a few of the 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 spots along the way in his career at this point. So he went on to do a movie called Murders... Oh, no. Murders in the Rue Morgue. da 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 Never gonna find me. da 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 uh, <clears throat> Which is what he basically did instead of taking Frankenstein 
uh, it is a Poe picture, like many Poe pictures, that has no resemblance to the original story or the characters in the story. Uh, he's a he's a sort of a madman that kidnaps a woman and in- injects her with the blood of a gorilla, I guess, to create she gorillas. Uh, I'm looking it up now. Murders in the Rue Morgue was also 1932, so same year as White Zombie. He basically, who he has one of those. He has a kooky name in this one too. Uh, Doctor Miracle, M I R A K L E, and he has this uh, innocent woman, uh, La Espagne, played by Sydney Fox, kidnapped. And, and has her mother killed, leading to suspicion falling on her fiancé, ha-ha, who's a medical student who had already become interested in the earlier murders that took place in the story. So, <laughs> the, let's see, Flory, d- directed by Robert Flory, who suggested adapting Poe's story as early as March 1930, but was only attached after being taken off of Frankenstein. So he gets yoinked off of that universal picture, and makes Rooters in the Room Morgue for... Who puts it out? That's Universal as well. Okay. So they kept Bela and they kept um, Flory in the same studio system, but they didn't let them do, or they didn't let the director do Frankenstein, and either they didn't let Bela do Frankenstein or that Bela didn't want to do Frankenstein. Um there's it notes only a few elements of Poe's story remain in the script by Tom Reed and Dale Van Evie or Avery. Yeah. I tried watching, um, the Raven recently with Vincent price and law. Um, apologize for my, my almost, almost missed step there that, uh, I almost said Lon Chaney when I meant say Peter Laurie. Oh, I love Peter. So I love Vincent price. I love Peter Laurie. I'm a bigger fan of Lori and um, Sydney Greenstreet together in <laughs> in Casablanca, and even more so in the Maltese Falcon. Those two together are just unstoppable. It's fantastic. Oh God, they're so good. Uh, you know, I uh, I was really disappointed in how silly it was. It looks like they're Peter Lori and Vincent Price are like improvising a bunch of it. It's a it's a very silly comedy. Um, it's not a gothic horror, unfortunately, at all. So that's The Raven. I don't have any opinions on The Raven that had John Cusack in it. I haven't seen it yet. It's from 2012. What, 20, let me check. 2012. Oh, my God. That's 11 years old. Is it? I'm bad at math. Anyways, he... <laughs> it looks like uh, Flory... Let's... Uh, oh, very much of the story of Rooters and the... Uh, Rooters... Murders in the Rue Morgue was changed to accommodate the role for Lugosi. Flory left the project but returned, arguing with Universal about elements such as period setting. After production wrapped on November 13, 1931, it was brought back into production for five days of reshoots and reordering of scenes in the final edit. So he does, so Bela does White Zombie, I guess, the first half of 32, and he does Murders in the Rue Morgue for the second half of 1932. Um, Initial reviews of the film were harsh. Um, Later reviews from historians and home video reviewers were lukewarm. The film led to other Poe stories being adapted by Universal Pictures. It was the first to have Lugosi in a role of either a mad scientist or a doctor. Roles that he would reprise, (sighs) reprise later in his career. On the, the Black Cat and Bride of the Monster. So, what's the bit about the blood transfusion here? Um, one of Bela Lugosi's victims is a prostitute. She's found dead in a river. Her body's taken to a police station. Um, they want to examine the victim's blood, but the morgue keeper forbids it. And um, so they bribe the morgue keeper to draw some of the victim's blood and deliver it to him the next day. There's a foreign substance in the blood of the prostitute and other murder victims. So then we get to, oh God, the, uh, the issue 
of these connected murders being linked to um, a mad scientist played by Bela Lugosi abducting young women, injecting them with ape blood to create a mate for Eric, his talking sideshow ape. This all takes place in 1845 Paris, France. Oh, goodness gracious. Tale as old as time. Song as old as rhyme. Uh, I won't spoil the ending. I'm sure it, it, you're you're chomping at the bit to go check this out. Uh, I say that non-ironically. So I don't want to ruin the fun for you of, of how this all plays out. But yeah, yeah. Talking ape. Making a bride for it. And interestingly enough, before Bride of Frankenstein. Hmm. Hmm. However, Bride of Frankenstein is one of those, like, it's, it's the Godfather 2, you know, of Frankenstein. Like, the Mario Puzo Godfather novel had the stories that were adapted into two movies, just like Mary Shelley's Frankenstein or the modern Prometheus had, you know, the main sort of ideas and, and, and uh, I guess, plot. It's not, it doesn't follow the plot of the movies, but you know what I mean? It had it had within it what was adapted to Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein, the films. Now, Bela works pretty steadily through the 1930s and 1940s um, and eventually ends up in Son of Frankenstein. Uh, he will, I think he was also in like House of Frankenstein. It's been quite a while. It was, been, it's been since I was at Joe's. Joe's house. If if you listened to the first Halloween episode I ever did with my friend Joe Moore, I mean, I did it by myself, but I interviewed my friend Joe Moore about this amazing three day horror marathon he had at his house with his roommates back in two thousand and five, six ish, somewhere on there. Oh my god, it was amazing! It's the best. It's one of the best memories I have. Like, unfortunately, I didn't like. I wasn't able to hang out with these guys for three days. We were just in town playing a show. It was in like, I want to say it was in like Philly. And then we were coming to New Jersey the next day. And he was like, come out to our place. We're having a three day Halloween marathon. Uh, if I remember it right, I'm not sure if I am though. I didn't have to go back and listen to my own dumb episode to find out. But you know, he, the, the short story is this house full of young people in their early twenties. And then us, you know, in our meh, mid to late twenties, we're just like barbecuing, drinking, making food, eating, falling asleep on the floor in various couches in front of two different living room TV sets, one upstairs, one downstairs. And they each like the roommates all had a plan and they were printouts on the walls dictating what time every movie should start and what the order of the movies was. And it was like the night that we were there partying and falling asleep. Eventually, I think I saw demons and demons Two. And a bunch of other like 80s era stuff. And then I woke up the next morning and was having breakfast beers while watching House of Frankenstein and Son of Frankenstein. <laughs> and maybe another one I forget, but I remember I did watch the one where Bela Lugosi was Igor, you know, which is a bit of a fall from what his intended projected uh, career was supposed to be for him by by most accounts, I believe. Man, uh, if you want to hear people, people in the know that grew up with that stuff, raving about it, um, not that they grew up in the 30s, but they grew up way later when these were all on television, uh, uh, listen to the Gilbert Gottfried's Amazing Colossal Podcast episode featuring Dana Gould. <laughs> I think they talk quite a bit about all the monster pictures that they saw on television when they were young. It's quite a few years old, though. So then... Unfortunately, Bela's accent holds him back from a lot of leading man roles that he had wanted. <clears throat> he certainly had the charisma. He had pretty, you know, some good looks uh, that people liked, but he didn't have the American command of that transatlantic accent, you know, that fake, that fake movie accent American leading men had, I think, for... It was popular for a good, I don't know, I don't know how long it lasted. It was 10 years, 20 years. There's YouTube videos about it now. Why do people in old movies talk like this? Like, hello, darling. Like, they're not quite British and they're not quite normal Americans. They have a weird, 
sort of it starts as a New England accent, but then it's made even I don't know, stranger. Um, he gets more and more dependent upon painkillers and opiates to deal with his chronic back pain, predominantly methadone and morphine. He tours around the United States at various times doing Dracula live on stage in the 1940s and 1950s. This in this constant movement and lack of comfort uh, increases his drug habit because it increases his back pain. He played some shows advertised as Bella, Dracula, Lugosi, and his horror and magic show. This is leading up to the early 1950s, where, like, weird shit like 1952's Bella Lugosi meets a Brooklyn gorilla starring Duke Mitchell and Sammy Petrillo. Uh, that story is its own horrible thing. But you can look up the trailer on YouTube and get a feel for what that was all about. It was a, a 16, 17 year old impersonator doing a, a Jerry Lewis bit. It was named Sammy Petrillo. He had gone on like the Milton Berle show or some other some other variety hour talk show doing his impression, you know, of Jerry Lewis, and it was very popular. And he got hired to do a lot of low budget, you know, films, not a lot. I take it back. He, he got some opportunities to do a couple of low budget films and other things. Um, he got, I think he got hired for like some appearances and stuff and, and maybe a little, a TV, you know, a little, a little funny gag here and there on camera, but really it, it came down to like maybe just this film and one other, um, it's hard to find any information about Sammy Petrillo these days on the internet. And that is how Jerry Lee Lewis wants it because he got the guy blacklisted from working in, in pictures after he did more than just do his little gag on, on television imp- doing his impression of, of Jerry Lewis. Um, but some enterprising movie producer and director decided I'm just going to pair up Bella Lugosi with this young kid and some some slab of man that's going to pretend he can impersonate Dean Martin. His name was Duke Mitchell. And, uh, and, and we're going to make a, a wacky picture with a guy in a gorilla costume. <laughs> it's, it's not, it's not what, you know, it's, it's not what you want as a Bella Lugosi fan, but this is the kind of situation that leads him to working with Ed Wood. Of course, and getting the part in Glen or Glenda as the the sort of overseer and narrator for the audience of what's happening in Glen or Glenda. Glen or Glenda that is like five movies in one movie and doesn't know which movie it is from one minute to the next, but it is it is amazing to watch and uh, very 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 provocative and uh, heartfelt is the thing about Ed Wood. Um, bad movies are not fun because they are bad. Bad movies that, that work, that are entertaining, are effective because they're created by somebody that had a vision and they had heart. And they wanted to put that heart and that vision into a creation that no one else could make happen. And unfortunately, these people don't have the budgets that other folks do to crank out, you know, Ant-Man and the Wasp. <laughs> or whatever 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 it is if you like it I don't care I'm not crapping on them I love me a lot of Marvel movies uh, but that there's a lot of assembly line factory built CGI stuff that's making people money and paying for Bugattis and, and uh, paying for people's pools that sucks um you know, it's it's charming, Glenn or Glenda. Plan 9 from Outer Space is charming. It is endearing if if you're the kind of person that enjoys those performances and, and what Ed Wood tried to pull off. But that's not today's episode, although the Ed Wood, you know, the Ed Wood influence on the Misfits and White Zombie, I, I feel, is pretty clear. And the, and the Misfits and White Zombie, I feel, are, are sort of like 
father and son or mother and, and daughter in a way, Misfits and White Zombie. Suppose that's a conversation for another time. I don't know between whom or when or where, but I do know I haven't talked about White Zombie, the band, in a while. So uh, in this episode, in this chunk of the episode. So let's get back to some, some stuff about the band. You know, Bella, he, his last little bit of film was featured at the beginning of Plan Night from Outer Space. And we'll just, we'll just leave it at that. We'll, we'll leave the story there for now. With his part being taken on by the, the, uh, the, the, the director and writer's girlfriend's chiropractor in a cape. <laughs> Never showing his face. So people couldn't definitively say that is definitely not Bella Lugosi. <laughs> Bela Lugosi fought in World War I, survived revolutionary uprisings, made it all the way to America, became a star of stage and screen, uh, quite famous and beloved and lusted after, and eventually replaced by a chiropractor in a cape that didn't show his face. But then... Very wonderfully portrayed by Martin Landau, who justifiably won an Oscar that year for the role. If you haven't seen Ed Wood, or if you haven't seen it in a while, please go fire it up. It's a love letter to creativity in general, and uh, it's a love letter to creative spirit. Now, much like the Nine Inch Nails episodes I did recently, I went to the Spin Magazine archives in Google Books uh, and did some searching for any white zombie content I could find from the 90s. Um, I found a few little pieces here and there, nothing huge. Uh, one that goes back, I, <laughs> I think the most substantial one is actually from Make Them Die Slowly era, kind of, but... There's one, let me start with an, an issue from January 1992, Nirvana is on the cover, and there's a section uh, of, you know, one of those, one of those new music preview sort of sections, right? So there's like small profiles on different bands. Um, the first couple of, of bands they, they highlight are pretty large articles, Teenage Fan Club, uh, and American Music Club. I don't, I don't know what the deal with the theme is with the word club that they love so much. Um, and then some smaller ones like Super Chunk, Main Source. And then the White Zombie one is about a third of a page with a big photo, uh, at least. That's kind of cool. There's Pavement, there's Helmet, Ingrid Chavez, um, Ad for Maxell blank cassette tapes. <laughs> Ween, Army of Lovers, Think Tree, Unrest, Blake Babies. And yeah, just, just so you know who was in the same sort of class of that year for <laughs> attention from Spin Magazine. White Zombie, it says, they look like total mutants amid the polyester stretch pants and cheap cameras of Tourist Central. Man's Chinese theater on Hollywood Boulevard, but they don't care. The members of White Zombie were once a New York noise band, but never felt comfortable in that scene. It was just too arty for us, says lead singer Rob Straker. Rob Straker, 1992, January, still going by that First pseudonym, I guess. Uh, when we started, I hadn't even heard of the bands we were supposedly ripping off. We just sucked. And people were saying, those kids are making a heavy statement. We were just noisy and stupid and having fun. In loading up a truck and moving to Hollywood, White Zombie has finally become one with the source of its inspirations. Horror movies. Serial killers. All things lurid, grotesque, and garish. 
Theirs is a cheerfully malevolent universe powered by a big, bombastic metal and ominous grunge. In one day, we got a jacuzzi, saw Mamie Van Doren's bra at the Fredericks of Hollywood, Hollywood Bra Museum, and Ivan DePrume, drummer, chased girls at the cat house. What more can you say? It's L.A. We have free cable, says Rob. The title of their Geffen debut album, Lost Exorcisto, Devil Music Volume 1, makes them an instant target for folks who sue rock bands after their kids commit suicide. But the zombies aren't worried. We should be so lucky that lunatics should want to bother promoting our record, says Rob. There really are backward messages on our record, Sean adds with a grin, but we're not telling what they are. The guys from White Zombie are walking down Hollywood Boulevard looking very trashy. Uh, oh, sorry. Loving every trashy, vulgar step. They buy a map of the stars' homes. They check out Dracula's coffin in the Hollywood Costume Museum. Mainly, they want to, the record to sell enough copies so they don't have to have day jobs again. Reasons, Sean? We live in Hollywood now, so if all else fails, we can commit some tragic suicide in the jacuzzi. Then, uh, on another issue, I see... Let's see. Uh, this is spin from November 1995. Um, a very cute looking picture of Alanis Morissette on the front. There's something about a gal with long, dark hair and a tank top that always does it for yours truly. What can I say? It's a weakness of mine. Um, and kind of in the middle of the issue, there's a, there's a feature called the future of rock. And there's again, profiles on a, on a bunch of different, uh, Either artists or singles. There's Tricky, number one. Number two is Trina Shoemaker. Studio Vision Pro. Poachers. I don't know who any of these are, except for I've heard of Tricky. I know Tricky was a huge deal in music magazines in the mid-90s. Uh, and then More Human Than Human is number five. <clears throat> White Zombies Radio and MTV hit More Human Than Human reroutes the loathed and timeless trail of heavy metal. Engrossed by technology, scored with gigantic, expanding guitar riffs, sung with gruff insolence, begging for a remix, this rawhide anthem rules. It's the sound of a headbanger indifferent to metal orthodoxy and wowed out of its mind by Ministry and the Wax Tracks crew's unsuave disco. And the song is one of the biggest of its kind. As frontman Rob Zombie says, I think the metal part is gone, now it's just heavy. Heavy metal has always been surprisingly savvy when it comes to technology. However trivial, the spandex trousers and Satan tuxes, uh, metal's essence, a good riff worth repeating at absurd volume, required the recording studio where guitars and tech tricks could uh, beat their chests in the mix. It may have started in the 70s with Black Sabbath's beloved Sludge, but in no time, metal moved to Def Leppard's Digital Watersheds. Similarly, pop metal bands like Bon Jovi were among the first to capitalize on MTV, primping their hair, singing power ballads, and selling tons of records. Is this, is, this, is this meant for people that have never heard of heavy metal music or don't know what heavy metal music is and haven't been alive for more than five minutes? But to hardcore punk fans, no genre of music seemed cheesier and less worthy of respect. I like bad brains, Rob Zombie explains. So to think that the Scorpions were heavy was a joke. When platinum alternativists took over in the 90s, influenced by Sonic Youth's explosions, uh, explorations of noise and teenage distortion, they shut down the pop metal franchise. Out went the showbiz, mascara, and solos. In came an explosion of loutish guitars. What doesn't carry over to the 90s rock is the virtuosity, the speed of the playing, the melodic complexity, the precision, the rhetorical imagination that goes with that kind of guitar playing, says Robert Weiser author of Running with the Devil, Power, Gender, and Madness in Heavy Metal Music. Metal's mad love for technology as a means to hardness remains and is rejuvenating the genre's future. Fear Factory is a fiercely meticulous L.A. band. Fuck yeah. Representing all of the headbangers who listen and soldier on no matter what MTV or Pearl Jam do. For them, metal gloms together everything from echoes of old Iron Maiden to the high-strung energies of 80s hardcore. Yet not unlike hip-hop and dance crews, the members of Fear Factory are also eager remixes. Remixers. Sorry, I'm skipping ahead to see if there's anything else about White Zombie in this, in this bit. <laughs> it's not very long either. Um, they talk about, uh, there's an EP called Remanufacturer. They've worked in the past with uh, one of the guys from Frontline Assembly. Guitarist and hardware supplier Dino Cazares proudly calls himself a metal traditionalist who's not closed-minded. 
What's happened is that electronic, electronic bands have become more metal, and metal bands have become more electronic. The old metal, in its discriminating tradition of its 7-Eleven followers, just started to really bore everyone. This is where metal world believers like Fear Factory and pop experimentalists like White Zombie agree. The all-important heavy vibe must continue to grow and prosper no matter what kind of machines and instruments convey it. And that's by James Hunter. <laughs> So let's not lose sight of the story of 1932's White Zombie starring Bela Lugosi. Uh, we, uh, we have more, more to break down about this film, and it is, uh, it is, it is, it is production, it is uh, creation, and reception, and, well, no, it got, it got not great reviews, that's all, that's all, there's, there's a few, I got a couple notes on that, but not, not a ton. Um, it's, it's amazing. I'm so glad I revisited it. It's been a long time since I last watched it, uh, before prepping the previous episode here. Uh, it's been years and, uh, boy, am I way more impressed with it now that I'm way older and have seen a ton more movies, uh, compared to where I was in 1999 when I got the DVD. <laughs> I was 21 years old. Good Lord. So, The financial success of the film in 1932 did basically what was needed to reassure studio decision makers at the time that, yes, horror movies will be a bankable genre for them to invest in for like the near and foreseeable future until, you know, until they decided it wasn't profitable or useful anymore. And they went a long ways (laughs) with those franchises um, last episode, you probably heard me like rambling off some detail or other about a movie I don't even remember the proper title of because I couldn't remember if it was like Castle of Dracula or House of Dracula or Son of the Ghost of Dracula or whatever the heck it was. But man, or or Castle of Frankenstein. I'm, I mean, there's some of you now that are old, old school film, you know, uh, enthusiasts that have seen these a million times are like shouting at me. I totally you you have every every right to be angry at me right now because uh, I think. I, I transposed Frankenstein in, in Dracula, but I don't remember. There's a castle of Frankenstein and house of Fra- Frankenstein and son of Frankenstein. And, um, uh, I mean, <clears throat> they could do this stuff, I think on the cheap because the horror actors over time, you know, they didn't branch out into a lot, a ton of mainstream stuff. They just kept very active. Uh, your Lon Chaney, senior, junior, Karloff, Lugosi, you know, they did lots of stuff that was, they would probably be considered pretty low rent, um, low paying jobs as they got older. And the initial bloom was off the rose for the, for the first universal monsters boom. But you know, they worked into old age fairly. Con- I mean, Bella had a harder time and we can chalk some of that up to his opiate addiction, which we can chalk up to his back injury. Uh, but he got to keep playing Dracula on on the stage well into his later years and in the, in well into the 50, 1950s. And he, uh, there's an interview with him from the, I want to say the early fifties on the DVD of white zombie in this, in, in one of the two special features, I think that is on the thing. Um, but I'm glad that they have I'm happy to have anything there. That's not just a bunch of stuffy modern guys with weird looking haircuts just you know talking about how great they think things are and why blah 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 but uh he bill is talking about how dracula is the only film that's been adapted into plays all around the world and he can, and it's played every year so essentially he's like i'm you know yeah i'm typecast but i'm working i could he just he had just come back to america from uh from a, an engagement in, in england a tour there so anyhow they're are uh, other notes that I took along the way while watching the film with the commentary, the sort of film historian commentary. Uh, I'll get to his name. 
when I get to that part of my notes, because I, for, I forget off the top of my head what his name was, but apparently he wrote a book about the the film White Zombie and the making of White Zombie, so he was the most qualified guy. And he talks all the way through the whole film, beginning to end, and he's full of great information. It's it's really impressive, considering this is an era, I gotta tell you, you're a, you're a film fan, and you were buying DVDs because they'd just come out for the first time at this time. First DVD I bought was The Matrix, and the main commentary on that was like Carrie Ann Moss and one special effects supervisor and maybe a stunt supervisor I, I don't recall the exact disc and box as it was as it was sold to me in 1999 or you know it's still on my shelf with all my other movies I could walk over there and take a look on the back I suppose uh point is three people that worked on this most revolutionary movie of its time which is why I bought a DVD player in the first place for the first time in my life I was just like I was 20 21 years old I'm like I'm not buying the Matrix on VHS cassette tape. That doesn't feel right. This is too new and too exciting and too, you know, graphically and sound wise important to 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 have digitally. Uh, so they had this long movie. They had three people that worked on it. A genre defining movie that had already like had some awards or award buzz was going. It was incredibly successful. It was a huge blockbuster hit. And the three of them are just like sitting there watching the movie and making really boring observations. None of them has any charm or energy. Um, I'm sure Carrie Ann Moss could be a different story as as a person to work with or an actor or in, who, who knows how to emote. I'm, I, I'm sure she has plenty of charisma, but not on this not in this film commentary, she didn't. Uh, I barely. There's a lot of long, empty space in that commentary with three experts on it uh, that don't have a lot to say. So, so I'm just co- contrasting the value of this, you know, his, this film historian's take and, and and the background information he's filling in for you while analyzing the film in real time. He's not one of those guys that just like reads to you from his book or some articles that he wrote and ignores the action on the screen. It's, it's, it's a perfect companion commentary for, for an old movie like this. Uh, he points out, let's see, this is an indie film. It was shot on a really small budget. Uh, they worked days and nights so they could get it done in time. So it, it took a lot of risks, but it was highly profitable uh, because it was, you know, there's no studio overseeing what they were doing while they were making it. And they're, uh, they, you know, they weren't hassled by anybody. You know, the, the director's vision was, you know, very well executed accurately in the making of the film. He also points out, it's really interesting to me, horror films of this era, like White Zombie does, would incorporate little elements of comedy throughout the story. And it would, from comedy sort of from the actor's portrayals of certain little gimmicks or running jokes and things like that. And uh, this was a holdover from the stage play era that people were used to before spoken films. You know, audiences went to stage plays where people would talk and then they got films where nobody was talking and there's no sound. But there's no dialogue. There's There's music and there's, you know, dialogue cards being portrayed, you know, placed up there. So they know what is supposedly being said. But now we're in an era where people are speaking on film. And if you're used to a drama of some kind or comedy with speaking actors, well, you're used to seeing it on the stage and the stage, even if it was a very heavy drama would have lighthearted moments and human moments here and there for personality and to, to sort of, you know, so you don't get too bogged down in the case of the horror movies though. That was only one element of it, that familiarity and then the comfort of that style of entertainment for the audiences. The other element was there was still, if you remember, a great example being uh, the, the introduction to the film Frankenstein, where the gentleman walks out on the stage and basically war- says, you've been warned, like, this is going to be really intense. Uh, we, want to, we want to caution, because they, they didn't have, and that movie didn't have a ton of comedy to sort of break up the horror. In this movie, they were still doing it in a way where there'd be a little bit of, of breakup there so that the audiences wouldn't be overwhelmed with the terror. And this is still a time when moving pictures and sound on a huge screen in front of people was very moving and very impactful. And the fantasy element of it wasn't as easy to sort of distance your brain from at that time because people just weren't used to movies yet you know as a as a whole society that could you know afford to constantly go to movies where fantastic crazy scary things are happening so uh on to some of the characters 
and what they're all about and what they try to do in the next segment. For now, let's get back to the band. Seems like a good time to remind you we have no ads, we have no support, but we have no backers. Please leave a comment or a review when you can. So now I'm going to go back into Sean's account of some of the early days in New York City, uh, specifically around the CBGB's era where White Zombie was playing <clears throat> there quite a lot. And I, I, th- I can't do justice to this book. I, and my goal, and I think I'm accomplishing it pretty well, is to not read directly from the book so much that if you buy it, you'll be disappointed in how much you already know. I, I think it's going to be far from, from the truth. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen 12, 13, 14 different bookmarks in this thing for stuff that I did the initial research on. And I decided I was going to try to hit all these marks. And I don't think I'm going to do that. I don't, I think that's too much. And, uh, <clears throat> even if I did, let's say this, let's say I read the entire thing from front to back, every single piece of text, it would still be worth the money for the photographs <laughs> and all the drawings and the, uh, the notes, you know, she has from the eighties and nineties, uh, the, the music notes, like her own personal handwritten <clears throat> charts, basically her version of charts, kind of a short or musical shorthand. Uh, here's a chunk called CBGB's days. We must've played CBs a million times. This ad, and it points to something on the right that I'll read a few names off of is from 1986. The year Tom five joined as our third, not fifth guitarist. And we finally started playing live. Our first show was with our second guitarist, Tim Jeffs at a CBGB's audition night. He left town and was replaced by Tom. We would often employ low rent kiss tactics at these early shows, stolen blinking traffic lights, homemade pyro. And we would usually play one kiss cover rocket ride, war machine, or maybe God of thunder. One night we handed out these homemade masks of our new logo. Rob had drawn to the crowd and pictured is a little, uh, it's like a Xerox photocopy of one of the cutout masks she's talking about. And it's the monster face from make them die slowly. Uh, I mean, obviously this is before that album came out, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> the artwork was there, uh, way before the album was, was, uh, printed. And, uh, we handed them up to the crowd and demanded they wear them, which was highly entertaining for us. Ivan's Russian mother would show up at these shows in her bathrobe and end up setting off the alarm every time by opening the emergency back door while wailing about how unhealthy it was because there was no air in the club. She's not wrong. So in this sidebar cut out black and white newsprint advertisement, it says CBGB and OMFUG. If you know what those letters stand for, good for you. Uh, other musical for crap, uh, for, for upstanding gourmandizers, other musical fair. I don't, I'm not gonna, I forget. Um, I used to know <laughs> country bluegrass and blues with CBGB, uh, address phone number and Wednesday, October 29, giant metal insects, ritual tension, Greg Ginn and gone seven bucks. Thursday, October 30th, Moving Targets, Volcano Suns, Antietam, and Christmas, 10 bucks. Friday, October 31st, Halloween. Now, this is the part where you're going to think it's going to be White Zombie, but no, they didn't even get to play a Halloween show back then. It's Death of Samantha, Pussy Galore, Phantom Toll Booth, and Kill Slug. And that's with a one L. Then below that, we have Saturday, November 1st, Gut Bank, Lifeboat. Died Pretty from Australia. Carnival Season, $7. Then, Sunday, November 2nd. Here we go. Here's the big uh, 2 p.m. to 2 a.m. show for 5 bucks. White Zombie is listed fourth from last. The Bags, Crying Out Loud. Damage, Ed Gein's Car, 
Honeymoon Killers, Off Beats, Prong, Random Facts, Ritual Tension, Royal Crescent Mob, Rude Buddha, Treat Her Right, which is a band I'm going through a bit of a phase with right now. It's a, uh, it was a blues band that had uh, Mark Sandman, who would move on when that band broke up to form the band Morphine. He was the bass player, singer. After Treat Her Right is White Zombie. Good Lord. Uh, the next band is Rot, and then Dirge, and then Aggravated Assault. Um, other bands playing later th- that week um, have names like Chili Dogs, C-H-I-L-L-Y, not like the dogs are cold, not that they are hot dogs with chili on them. Um, Floor Kiss, Beat Feet, Saccharine Trust, um, and Live Skull. (laughs) God, that's great. I love I love band names. She says New York City was hardcore in the 80s, music wise and city wise. As I said, Rob and I first saw each other at the CBGB matinees, but we would travel all the way to Queens if Black Flag were playing. You could name any famous or obscure hardcore band I saw them. I saw Minor Threat's first show in New York City, and Black Flag, and The Bad Brain. So many times I lost count. Of course, New York had a huge hardcore scene, and I saw Agnostic Front, Reagan, Youth, Cause for Alarm, and the Cro Mags a number of times too. I even saw the Beastie Boys when they were still hardcore, before Cookie Puss appeared in Bleaker Bob's, which is a record store. I remember them wreaking havoc at Danceteria, chicken fighting, and obviously way too young to be in a nightclub. I even saw the young and the useless open up for Vice Squad, annoying the hell out of Becky Bondage by swatting towels at her while she was trying to perform. Before I moved to New York, I got into the local hardcore scene in my hometown of Raleigh, North Carolina. This basically consisted of corrosion of conformity, no labels, ugly Americans, and stillborn Christians. God damn it, what a great name. <laughs> what a great name. We would have to drive five hours to D.C. to see a show, since not many bands came up to North, or came to North Carolina. We were big fans of the D.C. See, that's to tell you how obsessive I am about direction. I'm like, oh no, she's, she's talking D.C. is North, I mean, D.C. is North of North Carolina, so you can't, you know, not up, it's down. I had to stop myself and backtrack. Uh, and removed the fact that my brain had inserted the word up to DC. Sorry about that, everybody. Aren't you glad you know this much about my creative process and the thoughts that go on in my head when I'm sight reading? Uh, We were big fans of the DC bands, especially Void. Reed from COC once drove all the way up there to pick them up, brought them back to Raleigh so they could play a show at a VFW hall. Any of you don't know that, it's VFW stands for Veterans of Foreign Wars. And like the Eagles clubs, like the uh, Masonic uh, halls, you know, these are these are a bunch of buildings in urban or suburban areas that basically just are there so that middle-aged men, VFW veterans, uh, in their in their case specifically, um, can have a gentleman's club that's not a gentleman's club. It's like they just get together like smoke cigarettes and drink booze and play pool and play cards and stuff. Um, for the most part, if you want to go on tangents with your friends, explaining the entire history of the Freemasons, be my guest. And if you don't know, there's podcasts about that. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, but for the most part, it's just, it's just old guys clubs. Um, but the point is, they weren't music venues. They were gathering places for like, you know, the rooms for like a buffet, <laughs> a buffet and a, and a, and a bar and kids in punk bands could rent them on the weekends late at night when those old guys would be at home, you know, with their wives, I am assuming, or, you know, doing whatever their grandkids or whatever. Um, the hours that those things weren't being used for those kind of, you know, after, uh, afternoon, <laughs> boozing and pool and cards and all that and whatever. Um, nowadays, a lot of karaoke, uh, that they were up for grabs. You could rent them and you could bring all your friends. You could, you probably wouldn't be able to break anything. Cause there'd be like, everything's made. Like the walls are like cinder blocks and <laughs> there's not a lot of nice furniture around. Um, make a bunch of noise. No one would really hassle you. I, I think, I think, uh, my guess my guess is, you know, results may vary from place to place and town to town, but I'm, I'm, I'm assuming there's a lot of punk bands that got to have a lot of, you know, really wild raucous shows at places like that and not get hassled by the police. 
because uh, they weren't really disturbing the peace like they were, you know, in the hardcore scene in, let's say, Los Angeles in the 80s, where the LAPD was just out to get everybody <clears throat> and destroy the whole scene. Um, I'm sure it still happens. It happened at the time. Yes, yes, yes. But, you know, um, the... Uh, <laughs> The ugly, let's see, COC had toured their asses off for years in that van, and ugly Americans put many miles on it as well. It was suicide to try to tour in that old heap. It should have been taken out into, the, into a field and shot, but it was all we could afford. Oh, yeah, White Zombie needed a van in 1987 and bought, and bought the one that <laughs> she's talking about. After many breakdowns, uh, it was finally, it made it up to New York, and as soon as it did, it got broken into. That was a given. Back then in New York, any out-of-state plates would warrant a break-in within 30 minutes. We got so tired of replacing smashed windows, and we were so broke, we finally just put a piece of plywood up where the long window should be. Later, that van would almost kill us, leaking gas and oil coating the underside of the van. Thank God no one smoked. This brings us to hardcore times in New York City. You weren't safe, your van wasn't safe, and you might commit a crime or two yourself just to get by. More than once, I sat in an empty subway station with someone behind me muttering threatening things. Once with a knife to my back. More than once... I went to court for hopping turnstiles. Uh, this was so customary that sometimes we accidentally did it right in front of the cops, which they did not appreciate. More than once, I ran from cops while flyering for white zombie. Uh, <laughs> buckets of wheat paste sloshing around in our hands and brushes covered in frozen slop at 3 a.m. Besides running from cops, we had to deal with skinheads who didn't appreciate our long hair and freaky look. They were easy enough to avoid. Just cross the street and hope they didn't notice you. Jay wasn't so lucky, though, getting pummeled by a gang of them once. Then there were some random scary incidents, like the time a businessman sucker-punched our friend Doe, a 16-year-old girl on St. Mark's. That is the one only time in my life I have partaken in violence, getting a well-deserved kick-in after my fellow punks had fiercely knocked him to the ground. I'm not proud to admit that at one point, White Zombie liberated some gear from a downtown nightclub. It had apparently gone unused for a year, sitting in storage. Someone didn't need it, and we did. We snuck in at 5 a.m. and rolled it out, spray-painted it silver. <laughs> uh, years later, this would be c happen to me when my gear disappeared from our White Zombie storage space and ended up on a Rob Zombie tour. But it's spray-painted red now, the tour manager told me, which I found a hilarious way to justify taking it. But I see it, uh, I see now it is all karma. Now, before I scoot on to other topics, let me read uh, one great big long paragraph from the first European tour, 1989. Sean says, Jesus, this was a tough tour. Jay had just joined the band and we had just released our second record on Caroline, Make Them Die Slowly. A small Dutch booking agent brought us over and had us playing every night through the winter for six weeks straight, including Christmas Eve. They told us the budget over the phone, along with the per diem, about 20 bucks a week. We were sure that something must have been lost in translation. Unfortunately, that wasn't the case. The tour manager, an American-hating Dutchman, gave us all our funds up front. Now, some people, myself included, are good with money and budgeting, but Ivan, on the other hand, saw a pair of leather pants on the first day of the tour and spent his entire six-week per diem on them. This left him literally begging <laughs> for our breadcrumbs at the breakfast table every morning. Meanwhile, Rob and I were not actually faring much better. We were both vegetarians, and in Europe, any free meal offered to us morning or night consisted of bread, meat, and occasionally cheese. I am not joking when I say we were slowly starving. Living on a few pieces of bread and butter. But every time we reached Eng oh, sorry, by the time we reached England, it was so bad that the press we got made note of how bony I was. I'll never forget Christmas Eve in Berlin, sleeping in a stinky space above the club, Two skinhead chefs preparing us some mystery meat we could not eat and alone, crying through the streets, trying to find a payphone that worked and would take my calling card so I could try to reach my parents. The fact that this was the worst Christmas ever was pleasantly overshadowed by stumbling onto uh, post Damer Platz later on Christmas Day to discover Germans were joyfully tearing down the wall and reuniting with loved ones for the first time since the war. <laughs> there were many other memorable moments on that tour playing at the Mitternacht in Hamburg and the same stage where the Beatles had performed numerous times, then walking down the Reeperbahn, Hamburg's red light district where prostitutes were out on display. And this, despite a huge sign forbidding women 
Another moment when being able to pass for a guy was helpful. Playing in an airplane hangar in a socialist squat in Italy, touring through Yugoslavia right before it fell to war and divided, trying to dock a ferry into England uh, for four hours during a horrible storm in order to make it to Leeds, then counting a dozen 18-wheelers blown over on the side of the road uh, once we landed, and then being able... Sorry, guys. And then being in a roadside fish and chips restaurant while its roof ripped off in the storm. Ah, the good old days. I know it sounds like I'm exaggerating, but I'm only sharing an inkling of the six weeks of hell. It was great to see your flow and to be there for such historic moments. <laughs> Couple of notes uh, about photos on this page that are worth reading just so you can imagine the image in your head. Uh, the photo top left is Jay running at me in Pisa when our ass of a tour manager decided to be nice to us for once and let us see such an historic landmark, but only because he had brought his bitch girlfriend along to impress her on the right in front of a club in Switzerland minutes before I got a 104 degree fever had to cancel our most important show playing with mud honey who were bigger than us in Europe at the time. Show starts in eight minutes. <laughs> So in the character breakdown of White Zombie, we got a couple of older guys. Um, you know, we've got the good doctor that tries to sort of uh, talk our main protagonist into understanding the whole danger of the zombie thing and and, and murder. Uh, Legendre, Legendre, excuse me, and what he's up to. And we've got, uh, you know, Mr. Legendre himself. And we've got the two younger guys that are sort of rivals as well. We've got Neil, who's the, the nice man in the white suit that's marrying uh, Madeline uh, after, they get to the, after they get to Haiti. And then we've got Beaumont. He's the anti-hero character, as described in the commentary. He gets to be like active and aggressive while the white-suited male protagonist, Neil, and his female love interest can stay innocent and fairly, fairly ineffectual uh, until the very, very end. Beaumont is a dangerous man to some degree in the mind of, of the audience because he's making a life here in the foreign island of Haiti. He's a white dude with weapons on his wall, high leather riding boots, uh, he's indications of being an imperialist adventurer in foreign lands. Murder Legendre, by comparison, has many glass bottles and various, various shades of liquid in them uh, around him when he's in his element, you know, his part of the castle. Um, they're behind him on the shelves when he's framed, you know, up close and, um, sitting on bureaus and they're not in an organized way either. Like all these glass bottles and, and jars, they, of, of varying degrees of, of filled up with some nefarious liquids, you know, they're not uniform. It doesn't look super scientific necessarily. So it implies sort of a renegade experimental alchemist, you know, pursuing, who knows what? Um, there are, and we'll get to Madeline in a bit. Uh, she's basically there to be a, a princess <laughs> that gets rescued. <laughs> she's there to be a victim. She's there to be a victim, and uh, and to represent purity. And uh, evidently, her her performance. She she had been you know on stage and in silent movies up until this point. And her style of acting that had been successful up until this point was not very animated or expressive or talky, you know. So, unfortunately, that resulted in negative uh, impressions from reviewers and audiences just feeling like, well, she's like halfway to being a zombie-like person anyway. And her, you know, the way she acts in the first third of the film before they turn her into a zombie. Um, there's sequences of zombies working in this, like, grinding 
machinery, like clockwork almost machinery, the sugar mill that's owned and operated by Mr. Legendre. And uh, these, you know, bits, you know, for I think there's one main scene and then another one a little bit later. They're intentionally filmed with no music and no dialogue. This also put off critics that didn't really take in the meaning of, of this sort of distinction between the other parts of the film that have action involving characters speaking and this, which was supposed to set the mood of horror. There's, you know, murder. Legendre is maybe coming in to supervise what's going on or have, you know, talk to, talk to Beaumont or whatever, um, or to meet, you know, uh, to, to just sort of have his presence shown there so the audience can see what is happening in his operation. It's supposed to be ominous. It's supposed to be unfriendly. Uh, unfortunately, audiences of the time and critics just kind of felt like it was off-putting and kind of empty and uh, didn't have any impact on them. <laughs> it was too much like silent films for them. Um, so like, how come there's no talking? We want, we finally got to the point where we can watch talking in film and there's this big chunk where it's just like slow and no one's saying anything. I don't know how to feel about this, but it's striking visually. It's fantastic. And it's, and it's, and it's horrific too. Very cool stuff. There are uh, bits in the conversation about the white in white zombie should be interpreted as an indicator of virginity rather than ethnicity, according to the commentary of Gary Don Roberts. Though I think it's more than fair to make both connections, personally. If you get it, you get it, and you are more threatened as a prejudiced white American, um, prejudiced being prejudgy, not necessarily hateful, but like you've already kind of taken in that message, and you see it as a threat. You see the uh, the Haitian voodoo being practiced primarily by a creepy white guy, but he's but the people under his power are black natives, and uh, and that's a threat to the virgin purity of the very 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 white lady who's very pale and gl- practically glowing, and almost always wearing white in the film as well, and also wearing when she, you know explicitly being framed with flowers around her and or wearing a long dress with sort of a, a almost a flowery kind of a pattern to it or a clover like image that's on it. And uh, this is kind of stuff that when I first listened to the commentary when I was 21, I'm like, this is too much. This, all this symbolism is BS. It's way overthinking it. Um, now I understand that, you know, film, this, these filmmakers and many filmmakers of the time were very conscious of visual images and, and symbolism that came from art and paintings and novels and a German impressionist films. And they were continuing to, you know, incorporate those into the kind of uh, techniques they would use to make you feel this almost subconscious awareness and symbolism of someone like uh, Madeline being pure and being virginal because the flower as anyone that's watched Pink Floyd's the wall a few times, of course is a, is a vaginal uh, symbol (laughs) as well. Uh, Anyways, there's that. I I can't go on any farther than that. I didn't take uh, human sexuality classes in community college. uh, So I will say no more. Uh, And yes, that's, that's a, that's an indication of my lack of pursuit of those kind of subjects as I, as, as the next 25 years came along. I did not pursue those texts anyways. Um, but I will say that as an older person, I do appreciate all the symbolism and I appreciate someone pointing it out and I appreciate uh, being able to be, try, try to put myself in the mindset of an audience member of 1932 receiving those images. It's like, if, if, you, if you receive it and you recognize it, okay. If you don't, Maybe it's happening on a subconscious level and it's making you feel something you can't quite pinpoint or it's totally going by you and you don't care. You either like the movie on its characters and story or you don't. All those interpretations are positive results, I think. <clears throat> so the uh, yeah, there's. Also a note in the commentary that at the time in 32, there were tens of thousands of striking coal miners in America. Uh, trying to secure shorter work days and safer work conditions. And this may be relevant to a murder Legendre's uh, comments to, to another character in the film about the benefits of his zombie workforce never stopping, never complaining. Now, 
to go back to the Spin Magazine archives. I have two more features to read from. Uh, the, these are like the, the latest and the earliest entries I found related to White Zombie. Uh, one is from March 2010. And there are short profiles of plenty of artists and musicians in the theme of like, hey, what are they doing now? Like, these are people that were popular in the early 90s or whatever. You know, Dave Detterer from the President's United States of America. Um, who, who else? Marcia Schofield from The Fall. Gary Valentine. Kate Schellenbach, the drummer for Beastie Boys and Luscious Jackson. Um, Chris Reese, drummer for Social Distortion until 1994. Stuff like that. So then there's Sean Zilt. Sean Zilt. I'll never know. Um, at this point, it says she's 43 in 2010. Oh, man, I'm 45. I've never done anything with my life. All right. <laughs> it says, then bassist, White Zombie, 1985 to 98. Now designer, photographer, New Orleans. When Rob Zombie disbanded White Zombie in 1998, bassist and former girlfriend, Sean Isolt, uh, suddenly found herself in what has become a uniquely modern predicament. She was quasi-famous and living in Los Angeles. Some people set out to be rock stars, but the attention kind of freaked me out, she said. People tried to recruit me for some all-star lineups right after the breakup, and it was with people I had nothing in common with musically. That really threw me off. After stints in Famous Monsters and The Cramps, which I saw at the showbox in Seattle when she came with Famous Monsters and played, uh, and played in The Cramps that night as well on the same stage. Her solution was to get the hell out of California. She relocated in New Orleans, where in 2002, she opened a bar called The Saint with now husband Chris Lee of Hard Rocker's Supa Group. When not dealing with the bar, she nurtured her artistic side, taking haunting photographs of semi-naked, semi-conscious women, which she soon began showing in local galleries. I grew up surrounded by my parents' pop art and psychedelic rock posters and began doing these abstract designs when I got my first box of crayons, says uh, Zilt, who attended Parsons School for Design in Manhattan. I stopped drawing all the years I was in White Zombie. It only started back in 2005 when I saw my mom dying in the hospital. I started drawing like mad, sitting next to her for days, and just never stopped. I suppose it was some kind of type of therapy. After Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans... Uh, Zilt was homeless for a few months, which she spent traveling around with her sketchbook. By 2006, it was full, and I started my design company based on those designs. Initially, Zilt had her drawings screened onto scarves, wallets, and other accessories. In January 2010, Barney's started selling silk pillows she designed. And there are plans for throw rugs and glass trays. Uh, Zilt still knocks around in New Orleans uh, with a band called Rock City Morgue. But after selling The Saint last year, she's happy to be focusing her energy in new directions. I loved every minute of White Zombie, partying with Timothy Leary and Dimebag Daryl, riding with the Ramones, getting driven halfway off a cliff at Johnny Depp's house, she says. But after years of being in bands where everyone gets a say, it's nice that I can do all this by myself. And if you don't know, you can go to her website and check out her designs and buy her stuff. Um, there's wallpaper, there's silks, there's prints of artwork, things like that. Then, going way back to Spin May 1989, there are album reviews for new releases, and two of them that are paired up together are Metal Church, Blessing in Disguise, and White Zombie, Make Them Die Slowly. Um, I'll skip past the Metal Church stuff and get to the part where it says, White Zombie, on the other hand, are out there five years yonder in some post-nuke landscape where metal can really admit... It really is all the things it's been denying these back decades. The evil, suicide-inspiring, drug-drenched ravings of servants of Satan, that is. Make them die slowly belies nary a trace of the New York City East Village art damage that A, a kicked the shins out of their first singles, and B, lurked in the corners of Psycho Head Blowout and Soul Crusher. And that, quite obviously, is a good thing. Surface reasons for the coarsening, though that's the precise term for what's happening here. Huh? That's what it says. Um, include frontman Rob Straker's transformation from Lucifer tongued Nick Zed extra to outright bitch magnet metal god. <laughs> All right. 
perhaps more importantly, procurement of a producer who's known for doing more than using the studio as a home base for pot runs. Bill Laswell, said producer, brings with him the simultaneously thin and heavy sound he's so fond of, CF Motorhead's Orgasmatron, and works wonders. Laswell, as the story goes, was sicked on the band by longtime white zombie fan Iggy Pop. Not too surprising, considering the similarities between Zombie and the Stooges at their most free jazz. God Slayer, which comes off as some bizarre fusion of, say, We Will Fall and L.A. Blues, and Vin evinces this best on Make Them Die Slowly. That song and Power Hungry, one twisted mind fuck of percolating bass and wind shearing, uh, sorry, wind shear vocal snippets. This is hard to read. Approach a zombie sound of yore. The rest, even better. Straker, writing in full sentences now, scores with scads of cyberpunk black humor on Disaster Blaster. Probably the most erotic thing to be swathed in metal since Samantha Fox did that aluminum foil pictorial. But that's another story. Demon Speed and Murder World swagger in similarly anarcho-Steppenwolf fashion. Both of them are multi-part opuses. Song links alone could make this White Zombies and Justice for All. Shortest clocks in well over five minutes. That move easily from white noise to amphetamine metal uh, to biker sneer. Partly due to Laswell's Marley Marl like splice technique and partly a result of Straker's shamanistic moaning, peaking and valleying all over the place. This is a murder world, brother, he lows on the song's chorus, sounding for all the world like a pimp suited street corner preacher due to break into a Travis Bickle soliloquy at any moment. Scary. In the most basic terms, Make Them Die Slowly might not be the metal LP to end all metal LPs, at least not any more than Paranoid or Killing Technology, to name but two MLPs to end all MLPs, but it's damn likely to give you more nightmares and chuckles than anything else money can buy you these days. That's by David Sprague. Wow. Wow. That's certainly one way to use words. And a lot of them in a very, uh, a very, very condensed space, Mr. David Sprague. So I refuse to expose my ignorance by looking up for you every single reference he made that I don't understand. Uh, but I, I did get that uh, Killing Technology is a Voivod album. And, oh, what was the other one I wanted? To, I, wanted I did want to look up, I mean, kind of want to look up that Samantha Fox picture <laughs> or pictorial but Nick Zed is a name I don't know so I looked him up and uh, he, the guy just died in February of last year it turns out he coined the term cinema of transgression in 1985 to describe a loose-knit group of like-minded filmmakers and artists using shock value and black humor in their work um, he directed a lot of low-budget movies including they eat scum Geek Maggot Bingo, War is Menstrual Envy, <laughs> among others. Uh, he wrote two books that were autobiographies, Bleed Part One and Totem of the Depraved. And then he had a novel called From Entropy to Ecstasy. He also published uh, 10 issues of a magazine called Underground Film Bulletin, which was his sort of way of promoting cinema of transgression. And... There was a Cinema of Transgression manifesto published in it. Also can be found in The Theory of Xenomorphosis in 1998. Looks like he did some music stuff, too. Uh, I, won't, I won't go on too much longer, but he toured with um, Lisa Crystal Carver's Suck Dog Circus, <laughs> uh, uh, where he, I guess he would show his films on the tour and then perform with an experimental noise band called Zyklon Beatles. <laughs> he released the Consume and Die seven inch single on Rubric Records in 2000. All right, moving on. I remember last time when I was reading out of that Pulse magazine article that came out a little before. Astro Creep 2000 was released. Uh, we're going to go back into that and we're going to finish it off. And I'll probably read a little less this time because 
while it's a well-written article by a good writer, uh, I think there was a little more value to what was in the front end for white zombie fans to listen to. Um, not so much the back end, if it's not an actual direct quote from Rob or leading up to a direct quote from Rob and framing it. Uh, there are, you know, like the next part that, that comes after where we left off talks about their management, con- you know, Andy Gould and Walter O'Brien, who uh, Pantera fans probably are familiar with if they know much about that band's history. Uh, the concrete management team. And they're the ones that got White Zombie on the uh, Nativity in Black tribute album with Children of the Grave. They mention how weird it is. The, the you know, the writer, it mentions how, how strange it is that the <laughs> recently uh, released Kiss curated Kiss tribute album did not feature White Zombie in any way. I think that's fair. That's fair to point out. It's a bit weird. Um, he says, perhaps lawyers at Simmons and Stanley were upset by Kiss samples on early zombie records. More data for would-be conspiracy theorists. Andy Gould's girlfriend owns the video production company that produced the More Human Than Human video. Uh, and Terry Date, who produced Astro Creep with the band, also produced the most recent album from the band Prong, another Gould O'Brien client. See, that's not, that's just normal. That's just, that's just professional relationships. <laughs> I don't know how that's data for conspiracy theorists. Um, they note, uh, let's see, you know, what an accomplished producer Terry Date is. And Rob says of the album, it's just so thick that I was kind of worried when we were recording it, it was going to be a pain in the, in the ass to mix. Cause there's like 72 tracks supposedly going on there. We'll get more into this, the technical stuff uh, with Jay later when it comes to that album. And he says, just to tweak every sound. So it popped and it didn't eat up every other sound. Every little guitar hit has 10 guitar hits and 10 drums and just noise. There's so much shit layered on, there were, there's a type of thing that, depending on what type of stereo you listen to, if it's more bassy or more trebly or whatever, it sort of trails off there. Uh, the interviewer goes on, blah, 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 about uh, the Lost Exorcisto being a slow climber. And they talk about song construction. Uh, you know, Rob points out these aren't like three chord rock songs someone could play in his hotel room. We would try to write on the road. We would try at sound checks, but it was, you know, his voice trails off. <laughs> um, you know that uh, it says, you know, white zombie songs, and they put those in. They put that word in quotes. Are to a great extent studio experiments. Countless musicians have experimented with combining standard musical instrumentation with found sounds, from the groundbreaking early tape loop experiments of composer. James Tenney to the 90s metal band Biohazard, lamely splicing a square bit of Reservoir Dogs dialogue into a song. Yeah, that sucks. I hate Biohazard. Uh, I didn't know they did that. <laughs> that movie is so much better than anything Biohazard ever did. Anyway, they, they make comparisons to Public Enemy, The Bomb Squad. Um, there's a big audio dynamite album coming up. Uh, there's a lot of bands experimenting with hip-hop influences. And, you know, it notes that uh, Rob does like the Public Enemy comparison. He says, when I first heard Public Enemy, just that dense layering of stuff, it didn't sound like anything else. Just this rhythmic, raging noise. And I love Tom Waits' records. How he's just like, I'm going to sing through a tin can. And he talks about uh, recent Tom Waits' records. Uh, every song has its own thing. You know the music's organic when you think you hear the junk rattling on the floor in the room. Skipping ahead a few paragraphs, there's a good quote from Rob. Uh, this band was never for incredibly talented people who could play whatever they wanted, Rob says. That's almost a hindrance anyway. We kind of knew what we liked and what we hated, and you have a certain level of playing, and you kind of, well, do your best to get it out. Over the years, as people got better, it got easier. With this record, I could totally imagine a sound and Totally, 100%, it would exist. On the other records, it was about 70% of what I was thinking, and before that, 20%, you know? Um, John Tempesta, on the video shoot for More Human Than Human, makes a correlation between the video 
shot and the recording of Astro Creep. A lot of the time, he was just doing what he was told to do and didn't plan on understanding it until Rob completed the work. That's what everyone said, Rob says. There are certain things there's just no way to express because I can just hear it. I can hear where the vocals are going to fit. I can hear where all the pieces are going to go. A lot of times when the band is playing, it seems to them really lame. They're like, this sucks, man. But it just comes together. It's a real building process. It made writing this record very difficult. More Human Than Human seemed like one note over and over, and it made no sense to anyone else until you started layering in all the vocals and the slide guitar and stuff. Then people were like, wow, you know, this really makes sense. And here's another shitty thing they say in the article. One risks neglecting the input of Jay, Tempesta, and especially Zilt, who founded the band with Rob in 85, but close to two hours of interviews with the three reveals little insight into the nature of the band's music. Yeah, um, maybe, maybe you could have asked some better questions. I don't know. I don't know. This person seems like a decent writer or interviewer, but it doesn't sound to me like it would be all that hard to get the members of White Zombie to talk about influences or what shapes their music style at all. I think they're pretty good with language. Um, I think it might be more likely that the interviewer just wanted to focus more on the lead singer. <laughs> Or liked talking to Rob more. I'm casting, I'm casting my doubts on this. Is all I'm saying. Uh, they talk about where everybody's from. By all accounts, the songs are very much collective compositions. Most of the major riffs, aside from Jay's leads, are attributed to uh, Isolt. Jay's progress as a guitarist is evident everywhere. Rob routinely attests to how much Tempesta's drumming freed him to experiment more. Nonetheless, rock and roll is art by committee, and Rob clearly holds White Zombie's gavel. That would be, that would be a, a judge and jury comparison. That would be a, a courtroom scenario comparison, not a committee comparison. Would it? How do do all? Unless there are all committees that have a gavel, I don't. I'm not, I think that metaphor got mixed up a bit. I hate. I hate that so much. This doesn't do you, the listener, any good. But I just hate people that mix metaphors. <laughs> in print, in print, it's one annoying thing when you're in a stupid meeting at work and your boss or someone else that's ruining your life every day is is uh is is using those <laughs> kinds of mixed metaphors that don't that don't connect but they heard it and they think it makes them sound smart gonna have to take that bull by the by the tail and uh nip it in the bud uh yeah 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 but to put it in print and have no one to, to have nobody like edit that <laughs> is kind of crappy but hey i don't know how many employees there were at pulse magazine it was a free magazine after all Skip ahead a little more. They talk about the making of the video again. Uh, Rob says, I wanted to pack this room just like my house, like my room when I was a little kid, like my whole life has always been. But I couldn't because I couldn't put anything that was recognizable in there. Everything had to be obscure, which was exactly not the point. Literally, I could not put the Ultraman statue in the video. It got weird after a while. It almost got to the point where the uh, it almost got to where the whole point was defeated. He taps on a set of round tin film canisters sitting on an end table. In this old Super 8 footage I have from the 60s that I wanted to use in the video, there's actually a scene of me and my brother when we were little kids going to meet Ronald McDonald, and it's really creepy the way it's filmed, the old footage. I wanted to use it because it's very scary. But guess what? I can't. I can't use Ronald, even though it's, you know, my memory. <laughs> I'm going to read this next, uh, this next bit simply because of the movie that it mentions that I loved when I saw it in the theater and then just laughed at when I saw it on video many, many years later. <laughs> well, I'll take it back. I loved it. If I saw it in the theater, I loved it in the theater, but I definitely watched it on VHS as a rental as a teenager and loved it and then, uh, and then saw it in my 30s and thought this was very dumb. Um, let's see. Rob's learn and every... Every rap group since De La Soul was sued by the Turtles. It's, it's talking about samples being you know, litigated. The cultural ramifications bring to mind William Gibson's currently Vogue short story, Johnny Mnemonic, about a data courier who transports information in a special chip in his brain to which he has no access. Rob's living room, like his memory, like White Zombie's music, is crowded with cultural objects, treasure pop, ar pop artifacts that, in his words, spring the memory. I love playing Tempest, Rob says, of one such childhood relic, a video game in this case, but I won't play Mortal Kombat. 
that's some other kid's childhood memory, not mine. I mean, some kid is going to hear that fighting noise when he's 30 and get all sentimental. Destroy him. Ha ha ha. <laughs> Good old days. Like with Star Trek. When I was a kid, it was on three times a day. I remember kids would come over and be like, you want to come out and kick some ball? And I was like, no, man, I got two more hours of Star Trek left. <laughs> but today's show is about as exciting to me as watching General Hospital. As for today's TV heroes, Beavis and Butthead, their, and their role in Breaking White Zombie, Rob can only say, hey, it's got to be mentioned in every article. His tone of semi-resignation registers as he cites sales figures to show the level of the band's success prior to Beavis and Butthead's... Uh, uh, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, the last two uh, paragraphs are, uh, so much of White Zombie's lawyer's time is spent worrying about what music the band has appropriated and buried deep in the mix. And so much of their fans' time is spent tracking down the Sonic it references. One kid wrote a letter, says Rob, in which he had the source for every sample on Les Exorcisto. Exorci- oh, oh, that's crazy. Out on the internet, such sample lists proliferate on news groups like alt.music.beastie stash, uh, dash boys and alt.rock and roll.metal, where research minded fans innocently annotate their favorite songs. Enterprising lawyers for ASCAP and BMI are likely stalking these lists, copyright holders being on only a phone call away. Blah, blah, blah. blah, blah, blah white Zombies going on tour now, the end. Now, I'm going to leave it at that for today for this episode of A History of Rock and Roll and Film and Rock and Roll. I would like to thank you all for being along for the ride. I would like to thank you for giving a damn about how movies are made and written. I would like you to appreciate yourself for caring so much about rock and roll or white zombie or metal or music in general, whatever it is that lights your fire. And uh, thank you for enjoying and supporting a show that has no uh, co-hosts. It has no engineers or producers other than myself, and it has no steady stream of content being fed by social media or uh, current events, which is what a lot of podcasts are successful at. I, on the other hand, did the stupidest thing possible and uh, covered very, very specific niche things that don't even necessarily appeal to the fans of, uh, I don't know, the next artist I'll cover or the next movie I'll cover, so... Cheers to you for being here and up for something weird, friends. Uh, Like I said, I'm going to wait and see if Ivan Duprum gets back to me on my interview request in any form or fashion, and we'll pick up where we left off for episode three. Um, I still have a a final Van Halen episode to do, too, as well, but I had to jump from that uh, into White Zombie for for Halloween, obviously, last month. Uh, I want to remind you also, before we go, that... You absolutely deserve to be loved and cared about, and you deserve to have a good time, and you deserve to pursue things that make you happy. Please don't ever forget that. If you uh, if you need help, reach out for it. There's a there's a link or two in the description to maybe a couple of services that might be helpful for you or someone you know if they're in a bad way. Uh, And until next time, please remember that rock and roll is the best, and so are you. And now, instead of my usual musical outro, I'm going to leave you with a song by Jay Younger called Blues for 2XL. This came out around 1995 in a guitar magazine compilation of, of fuzz guitar enthusiasts, and Jay was one of them. He posted this himself on his own blog back in around 2008 or 9, so I have no qualms about sharing it here. Obviously, I'm not profiting from this in any monetary fashion, and I don't think he would be either (laughs) if he was willing to put it up on his blog for free for download. I didn't do anything tricky here. Uh, It was it was available for direct download from his his own blog. So clearly nobody was coming after him for, you know, taking ownership of this piece after it had been released on a very limited edition compact disc back in the 90s. So. Uh, for for Jay Younger fans and White Zombie completists, please enjoy this instrumental called Blues for 2XL by Jay Younger, and I'll see you again very, very soon. Oh, wait, I meant to uh, also say, uh, if you want a long-form interview with Jay Younger in the modern day that doesn't uh, explicitly talk only about his music, uh, look up Deviate with Rolf Potts. It's a sort of globetrotting um, always traveling sort of podcast, and that's what Jay Younger is all about these days. And... Um, there was some interesting anecdotes about White Zombie in there, but also his life after. Now enjoy the song. Uh. 
Thank you for turning me on. I'd much rather be on than off. I am 2XL. <laughs> I, I had a lot of fun, and I certainly hope you enjoyed operating me. Please turn me off now. 